called a mischievous, mordant, analytical, and ceaselessly imaginative by the New York Times, and hailed simply as God by Simpsons creator Matt Groening, Bill Plimpton is widely regarded as the hardest working, most prolific animator in the business. His instantly recognizable and unique style catapulted him into the pop culture pantheon and cemented his place in the stratosphere of animation greats. Mention independent animation and animation auteurs, Bill Plimpton's name is at the tippy tippy top wow. of that list. <laughs> All hail the king of independent animation, Bill Plimpton. Welcome, Bill. Very pleasing uh, introduction. Wow, I'm, I'm embarrassed. <laughs> no, no, you, we are blessed to have you in our presence at the Spark Animation Festival, Bill. Let's uh, look at your origins. Uh, I was looking at your biography. You mentioned that you were uh, a syndicated newspaper cartoonist for 15 years, mm -hmm. a political cartoonist, and later yes. you shifted to animation. And in this, your career parallels that of Windsor McKay's. I saw the book right behind your head there. Um, yeah. And yeah, he, to me, is a, is a genius, a, a total genius. And uh, I do see some similarities between his career and my career, definitely. But he never made a feature film, sadly. It's too bad because he would have done a great feature film. Yeah. But uh, as you know, Hearst forbid him to do uh, animation until he had to stop. Yeah. And what made you shift from political cartooning into animation? Well, I'd like to go back earlier, if you don't mind. Sure. We've got an hour to talk. Yeah. Um, I think uh, I always loved to draw as a kid. That was never, um, you know, an issue. I knew I wanted to be an artist at a very young age, like eight, eight or nine years old. And uh, then I started watching animation on TV. The Wonderful World of Disney was on TV. And, um, and then of course the Mickey Mouse Club, but that just sold me. I said, that's what I want. I want to be an animator. I want to work for Walt Disney as an animator, which, you know, everybody wanted to do, uh, especially now. Um, and so that was my first love was, was to make my drawings move. But when I got out of call or high school, rather animation was a dying art form. Disney had died by then. The studio was almost bankrupt. Fleischer Brothers was out of business. Warner Brothers had stopped doing animation. The only thing happening was um, Hanna-Barbera. And I hated that. Uh, I, that wasn't animation to me. So I decided I had to make a living. So I moved to New York and became a uh, cartoonist. I did uh, political cartoons, like you said, a political strip. I did caricatures. I did gag cartoons. I did uh, illustrations, uh, and uh, so I was trying to keep busy, you know, getting making money, doing whatever I, I could. And it wasn't until um, uh, 1987, actually 85, that I did my first real, real animated uh, short, and that was called uh, Boomtown. But I, I must tell you, I did go for one uh, session at School of Visual Arts. Uh, to study animation because that Milton Glaser was teaching there and you know a lot of animators were coming out of there but the teacher I got was so bad uh, that I learned nothing I was very frustrated and I just quit and I said I'm wasting my time in art school I'll, I'll just take out my portfolio and start being an illustrator so to answer your question animation has always been my first love that's what I really wanted to do and even today, I still do illustration and, and um, you know, caricatures and, and some political stuff, but it's really animation that is my, uh, my true love. Well, your, your first film that you talk about, uh, the Boom, Boom Tune? Boom Town. Yeah. Boom Town, pardon me. But in, it was 1987 when you did Your Face. Yes. And that's really your first cinematic theatrical release. What well, was the that? No? The story behind Boomtown was that I was doing an illustration as an anti-nuclear booklet for a woman named Valeria Vasileski. Mm. And uh, she's a really nice lady. And she said, I heard you want to be an animator. We have a song written by Jules Pfeiffer that needs to be animated. And I said, whoa, yeah, I get to be an animator. Finally, I get to 
you know, put my talents to work. And uh, she asked me to direct it, to draw it, to do all the color, the design, the storyboards, the layouts, everything. I said, wow, how much do I get paid for this? He said, well, we have no money. It's a freebie. But you know, it worked out okay because um, on the making of that film, that was my film school. That was my animation school. I learned every step of making an animated film. And as you know, or maybe you don't, back then it was quite complicated because you had to do uh, you know, little reel to reel tapes of sound effects and voices and, and music and mix them together. And the animation had to be shot on a big rostrum camera and you had to go to labs and get answer prints and negative prints and, and all this rigmarole that was so expensive and so complicated whereas now it's, it's so much easier so anyway this this making of the boomtown film really introduced me to how to make an animated cartoon and i said jeez now i know how to do it i'm gonna make my own film i'm gonna make something you know whatever just some crazy thing just to experiment and that was your face and that changed everything that was just and that's what I was thinking that it's your personal film your first personal film yeah so what was that experience like seeing your first personal film in the theater well I remember the first time I saw it was at an ASIFA meeting here in New York and this there's a lot of big name ASIFA people at that screening it was a competition and we had people like Arl Blackman and Howard Beckerman and George Griffin and, and Candy Kugel and people like that, who I didn't know these people, but I found out later who they were. And I was a new kid on the block and I was sat way in the back and I was covering my, my eyes because it's such a goofball film. I mean, there's no plot, one shot, no editing in it. Uh, it's a bad song <laughs> and the animation makes no sense at all. And I thought they're going to laugh me, not laugh me, but they're going to kick me out of the screening room. And after about three seconds into the film, the people started to laugh. And I've never heard people laugh at my drawings before, simply because they were illustrations and they went out to newspapers and magazines and, and who knows if people laughed or not. But to hear a whole room go crazy in laughter uh, was, um, uh, it got me high. I mean, I felt like I was on drugs. It was just like, whoa, this is a new experience for me. And afterwards, uh, I think it was Howard Beckerman came up to me. Uh, I don't know if you know Howard, but he's the main teacher here at School of Visual Arts and Animation. He's sort of the, the, the main man. <clears throat> He said, oh, you Bill Plumpton? I said, yeah, that's me. He said, let's go out and have a drink and talk about animation. I went, hey, finally, I'm home. This is where I wanted to be all my life. My people. <laughs> yeah, my people. It took me so long to, to get here, but it was really um, a wonderful experience. So the next day after that screening, I called up all my newspapers and magazines, and I said, I'm quitting print. I'm going into animation. And they said, you're nuts, animation's dead. It's a dying art form. Nobody does animation anymore. I said, no, I think I can do it. I think I can uh, you know, make a living doing animation. And uh, lo and behold, it, it worked out. Well, look at your first film out. Yeah. It, it gets nominated for an Academy Award. Yeah. I, and, and, it I still, <laughs> sorry. I say, and it loses, and it loses to? Uh, the Man Who Planted Trees, which is a great film. Well, you know what? Every time I've been nominated, I lose to a Canadian film. I, I lost to, uh, uh, what's that one by, um, oh gosh. Uh, there's a beautiful computer film, Chris Van, Chris Van. Oh, Landreth. Chris Landreth? Yeah, Chris Landreth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Ryan. Ryan, yes, thank you. Yeah. So I just, I can't win against the Canadians. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but. But I tell young filmmakers that what happened to me was really uh, rare. Their first film rarely takes off like that. I think a lot of it was because I'd been an illustrator for 15 years. So I knew how to draw. I knew how to do comic strips. I knew how to tell a story, you know, keep people interested. 
so that that was a big uh, a big help. But um, I, I remember when it premiered in Annecy, um, and the same thing happened. Everybody in the audience went nuts, and uh, afterwards, people coming up to me and said, "Gee, we really like your your face film. Um, would you take five thousand dollars for BBC?" Uh, would you take, you know, $8,000 for Annecy Plus, or I'm sorry, um, uh, Cano Plus. And I was, it was shocked that I was making money on this stupid three minute film that, that had no plot, no bad song, <laughs> everything was bad about it, but apparently struck a nerve. And um, from then on, I just continued doing um, and well, there wasn't anything like it in that period. And when you look at that, that led to dozens more shorts yes. that you did that you're playing regularly in the 19 mm -hmm. going into the 1990s. Yes, MTV, you're right. Liquid Television, yeah, um, and such. So I mean, that was, you know, that spawned a whole generation of that. But you were really in instrumental in doing that. Yeah, MTV was really the uh, so important. I didn't know how important MTV was because. People became fans of mine on MTV, and they never MTV never printed my name on there. <laughs> um, they just showed the film, and that was it. Didn't show the credits or anything. And so a lot of people have come up to me and said, "Oh, you're that 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 um, what what they call me the uh, the, the vibrant vi vibration guy. You know, my film vibrated. Yeah. Was, oh, you're the vibration color pencil guy." And that's how people knew me. And, and apparently MTV was all over the world. I mean, it was it was everywhere. Yeah. But also, I, I have to say thank you to Spike and Mike. Uh, they showed a lot of that those films. And also Terry Thorne, who did the, the tournee of animation. Those, both those programs were really popular. Um, oh, and got my that was film. my introduction. I mean, the way I saw How to Kiss, 25 uh, Ways to Quit Smoking, Nose mm -hmm. Hair, it was at the Mike and Spike Festival. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. They were big. They were very big. Yeah. Before the internet, that's how we saw animation. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I first met uh, John Lasseter. He had Luxo Jr. there. Right. And a lot of those guys um, were really uh, involved in that. Joe Ramph. Uh, I was a big, good. That's where we first saw like uh, Marbman's films. Yeah. You're Mike right. Judge. You're right. You're right. Yeah, all the NFB and, stuff. and also uh, Marv Newland. Yeah, Marv, Danny Antonucci's Lupo at all the shows. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it was it was tremendous. Yeah, so um, but you mentioned your style, this uh, this wiggly, loose hand sketch style. Mm -hmm. um, it's very distinctive. It's unmistakable your style. How did you come upon that? How do you? Well, that's not original. I wish I could say I invented it, but I've seen it before. I forget where, but it was used in a bunch of animated films. Um, and it just made sense to me because I, I draw in pencil. And so it made sense to do color pencil. And um, and when you freeze it, it doesn't look very exciting. But when you, you uh, add one or two more drawings to it, it really sort of has a life. It really comes to life. So um, I borrowed that, uh, among many things. Um, you know, people say I have a really original style, but uh, I've been influenced by so many people mm. and I take from them, I borrow from them. Um, you know, people like Arl Blackman and, 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 and um, uh, John, La not John, uh, Mark Newland and Danny Anucci, those guys are big influences. Um, Ardman people, um, you know, there's, there's so many people that influenced me, Windsor McKay, uh, of course, Walt Disney and Warner Brothers, Tex Avery and Bob Clampett. Um, and so I, 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 I see a lot of those films and I, I sort of uh, store them away in my brain and, and when I make the film, I use them. And I tell young students that that's okay, um, that, you know, you 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 are influenced by a lot of a lot of great artists, and they have to, you want to make them great artists, not bad artists. You want to be influenced by really good people, and that's the choice that that you have to make if you're going to succeed. Is if you're going to be influenced by someone, make sure they're really, really good artists. Now you seem to be one of the only modern animators that still personally hand draws 
every single frame in your work. Yeah. Have you ever tried having assistance or in between? I did. I did a film called um, uh, Hair High. And I just done a big job for Cartoon Network, a big feature, uh, not feature, but a one hour film for, and I had a lot of money in the bank. And I thought, you know, let's, let's uh, get some help. <laughs> let's get some people to help me out. And so I hired three or four really good animators. I mean, they're really good. And after about a week or two, I realized it wasn't working for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them, they couldn't really match my style. They couldn't draw like me. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying I'm, I'm a great artist, but I, I, uh, it's kind of realistic surrealism. And uh, number two, they uh, want a lot of money. They're very expensive and I don't blame them. You know, animators are, are very uh, good. Animators are very expensive. And number three, it took all the joy out of making these films. And to me, sitting down and drawing these things are, are just a pleasure. And why am I paying these people who can't really draw like me, charging a lot of money, doing something that I want to do? So it, it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a hobby, but for me, it's a pleasurable, pleasurable uh, experience to, to do the animation myself. Have you shifted? Uh, it's pretty laborious doing it with pencil and, and crayon. Have you shifted no, into the digital realm now? Uh, well, we, we scan them now. We don't uh, use a camera. Oh, okay. uh, so they are digitized eventually, and that makes it a lot easier. But um, I, uh, uh, I still do pencil and paper. And one of the cool things about it now is that um, there, there's a market for that stuff. I become collectible. Um, uh, there's a, uh, an auction house called Heritage and they're handling all of my drawings and I just finished a big auction of my stuff and I'm up there with Ralph Bakshi and, and you know, Peanuts and, and all these big name people uh, and I become collectible. So that's another really uh, excellent source of income for me uh, selling these, especially the Simpsons stuff. Those are very popular. Those are the your face drawings. And I still have a few your face drawings left, but they are they are for sale. If anybody wants wants we'll have them. to go to the Heritage uh, website. Yeah, on the I wall. Think, no, think, come to me. Come to my website. You can, oh, go to you. Okay, you know, there we go. I'll sign them personally. Yeah, there yeah. we go. Good to know. So that's that. another good reason why I, I still do pa paper and pencil uh, is because I have the um, uh, all the artwork uh, is is sale and it's uh, it's collectible well so yeah excellent source of revenue a revenue stream mm -hmm. for you yeah. yeah when you look at your themes you know you, a lot of your animation reminds me of tex avery meets surrealism you mentioned surrealism Thank and you. Um, <laughs> you and tex avery was that aspect of he defied logic he defied physics yes yeah if big is funny bigger is even funnier and yeah, he right. react to such absurd levels absurd levels yeah. And that's what I see with you, with where you defy this logic, defying physics, and it, but you continue to remind us, it's just a cartoon. Yeah. You know? but <laughs> well, it, yeah, go ahead and talk about that. Uh, when I was in college, that's when I started getting into surrealism. Uh, people like um, Roland Topor, I don't know if you know, he is a French cartoonist and uh, filmmaker too, actually and Magritte and, and Ionescu and, and people like that. Um, uh, and so I wanted to include that surrealism with the Tex Avery, uh, Bob Clampett kind of humor. And I felt that was something that was unique and original, even though I, I borrowed it from them. Uh, but putting those things together was a, was a unique uh, art form. And so that's sort of what I've been doing my whole life. And I'm not a great writer, I admit to that. Uh, so I try to keep my film somewhat um, uh, voice free, word free. And all the humor is in the visuals, the crazy, the crazy visuals. And so that's sort of been my trademark uh, throughout my career. And, and I'm working on a new film now called Slide. And uh, there's a little bit of dialogue in there, but mostly it's um, it's uh, visual visual humor, uh, very violent, very sexual, um, and that's another trademark of, me, of my stuff is is very sexy and very violent, which again, Tex Avery did very well. I'm I'm uh, 
Yeah, it, it seems to be, yeah, he challenged the taboos of sex and violence today. But again, yeah. you take it to such extremes that it's so, it's like. It has to be funny, yeah. Yeah, Bill's like, okay, I, if I can imagine it, I will image it. I'll draw it. So uh, yeah. As yeah. far as he goes. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Um, and that's, I think, one of the reasons I'm not a bigger name. I think the distributors are afraid of the um, adult content of my films, especially in the U.S. Uh, they want kids' uh, stories and kids' films. And um, I don't like making those kind of films. And I, I think there's an audience that's not hasn't been served. Uh, something that's more to their taste and you know animation is such a great art form it's just there's no limits there's no end of what you can do on that and why they can't make animated films for adults I do not know it doesn't make sense to me so I'm trying to fill that void I don't want to compete with Pixar or Disney there's uh, that's impossible for me they're, they're, they have too much money they have too much distribution I can't compete with them. So I want to make films that are, are unique and something that people want to see and they haven't seen yet. So yeah. that's I'm doing it. Well, the other thing is, I think you like your latest, some of your latest films, of course, in the last five years, mm -hmm. touched on those the politics. And yes, well, you know the reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm... Uh, Thank goodness I'm st I stopped doing that. I mean, when I did my cartoon strip, I did a political cartoon strip, and I did yeah. political caricatures. Uh, that's when they, you had Nixon and and uh, Reagan and people like that. Who was they were really fun to to caricature. Uh, but um, then I got an animation, and so I left the politics behind. But obviously, with the president we had the last four years, it made sense to uh, revisit that uh, that storytelling. Did you have, what kind of feedback did you get with Trump Bites series? Uh, a lot and very vicious, uh, very okay. vicious. As everybody says, you get a lot of hate mail and it's, a lot of it's kind of scary, mm -hmm. uh, but you figure, you know, what you're doing is, is really important. So uh, I had to keep doing it and, well, I wanted to keep doing it. And uh, it was, they were very popular and they, they were even, uh, Sean Hannity showed one of my films on his show because he was so offended by my 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 storytelling and animation, so that was kind of nice. But I never got anything from the man himself. I would love to have a tweet from him just to yeah. you know, glower at, but no, never got it. <laughs> no acknowledgement from him. Oh well, well, I enjoyed them so much. So, but Thank uh, you. yeah, part of uh, part of the political dialogue that was going on these past few years. Yeah. I'm sure. yeah. That's one uh, one good thing is that you hold up a mirror to everyday life and it's not just politics but also domestic life and mm -hmm. and religion things like that so. yeah relationships i love relationships. relationships that's always fun yeah yeah uh when we look at uh, you've been super successful doing shorts over 40 mm -hmm. what was your thinking when you decided i'm going to make a feature all by yourself yeah that was uh came about when i put together all my shorts onto a vhs cassette this was back in, um, had to be 90, 89, I think, 1989. And as I put them together and it included Boomtown and Your Face and How to Kiss, one of those days, all those films. And even some of my early stuff, my attempts to make animation in art school and even college, when I went to college, I, I tried to do one and it was a complete disaster. But I put all those together and I thought, well, that's an hour of animation. I just did an hour of animation, um, you know, in the last four years. And I said, you know, I've always wanted to make a feature, animated feature film. I always wanted to work on Pinocchio or, or something like that. So I said, why don't I do my own film? And so I got together with a, a, a friend of mine, a Maureen McKellarin, who uh, is a wonderful musician and singer. And we were good friends. And I said, let's do a new version of Yellow Submarine, but with American roots music, Delta blues, country, Western, rock and roll, jazz, that kind of stuff. That would really be fun. And um, so we, her and I wrote it together along with PC Bay. 
and um, we took about two or three years to do it. I did all the animation, of course, and I think I even hired a couple of people to do the coloring. Uh, so I didn't have to do all the coloring because that was a lot of work. And it was called the Tune. And it's it's available. You can get it now. It's and a lot a lot of people love the film. They they say they play it at their weddings and everything. And I remember I got into Sundance, which then was just starting to become big. It just had uh, as the year after um, Sex Lies and Videotape, and so every, all of a sudden everybody wanted to go to Sundance. So I was the I think the first animated feature at Sundance. And I went there and it got great response from the audience. People loved it. And again, uh, we didn't get distribution because, well, we got distribution, but it was very small distributor, uh, October Films. And they were nice people, really nice people, but they had no money. I, I didn't get paid for the film. Um, and, uh, but one of the cool things about it was I was at a party, a direct, I think the director's party where they invite all the directors there. And this, nerdy guy comes up to me you maybe you heard the story i don't know i think i told it out of vancouver but you're bill blemden oh my god i've seen all your films you're great i love the way you draw and everything what are you working on and it turns out this was a quentin tarantino who was there with reservoir dogs and um he was this is before he had shown his film and and of course he was the the scandal of uh sundance because People were vomiting his film and leaving the theater because it was so offensive. And and so we've been friends ever since. And we run into each other occasionally. And and uh, I've always wanted to do a film with him, you know, do an animated feature. But uh, I hear he's he's not doing any more uh, films. He's gonna yeah, I heard it. that. But uh, he'd be well suited him writing. And you I know, it would be fun to to work on a film with him. But we talked about it for a while, and he just the guy was too busy. Now, seven features later, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, this is the ninth one I'm working on now. Oh. The first one is um, the tune. The second one is, uh, uh, oh, what's it called? Uh, Plim Tunes. Yeah, Plim Tunes. And then the third one was uh, uh, I Married a Strange Person. And then uh, uh, Mutant Aliens. I should look around my my uh, studio here because I got all the posters up. Uh, Mutant Aliens, and then um, Hair High, and then um, uh, Idiots and Angels. Let's see if I can remember all of them. <laughs> and then uh, um, the what's it called? Cheat, cheat, yeah, cheating, and um, Revengeance, and then so the new one slide is my ninth my ninth animated feature. And I did them all myself, did all the drawings myself. It's about a million drawings, I think, something like that. But it was fun to do. I, I enjoyed making every film. One of my favorite films recently, when well, the last few years anyway, it wasn't your film, but you worked on it, was um, The Prophet. Oh, yeah. And your piece yeah. on, on eating and drinking. That was yeah. amazing. I love it. How did you get involved with that? Um, boy, I don't know. They just call me up. Roger Alice. Yeah, yeah. And he called me up. And then um, I said, Yeah, it's a great, it was a great deal. I, I had the book, actually. Uh, but I don't know where I got it. But um, he said, choose whichever episode you want. And he, they had like eight episodes, I believe. That's right. And so I choose food and drink, which I thought was fun. And uh, I did it. And then we went to Cannes with the film, which was really exciting. Um, what's her name? The famous actress, Selma Selma Hayek. Hayek. Yeah, Selma Hayek was there. And she was so charming and really friendly and really like she loved the artist. She loved the art in the film. And she was a really good promoter for the film. So it did pretty well. It, was, it showed all over the world. And, and it was a lot of fun. So I do those occasionally you know, to uh, to make some money to keep the studio going and also just to try something different. Yeah. Another of my favorite films recently, uh, I guess in the last 10 years again, um, was your short, The Fan and the Flower. Yeah. yeah. A departure from what you do, but- Well, that's because that was a commission film. Mm. Um, 
the guy, oh boy, I can't remember his name. Dan. <laughs> yeah, Dan O'Shannon. Thank you, John. Um, if I get stuck, I'll ask John. Is it? Good old, what's his name? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who can forget what's his name? Uh, and Dan was a writer for a TV show. What was the TV show, John? Frazier. Frazier. He wrote for Frazier. So he's a big time writer. He had a lot of money and, and a really good writer. And he was a fan of my stuff, apparently. And so he called me up and asked me to uh, animate this book. He wanted to do a book. And I liked it. I thought it was really cool. It's very, like you say, it's a departure from my stuff. First of all, it's black and white, which I rarely did. And also it was very romantic and there wasn't any sex or violence in it really. <laughs> But it was, a, it was a fun project, and he had hoped to get an Oscar nomination, and I did too, because the story is so strong, and I thought people would go for it, but for some reason it didn't, didn't get nominated. It did win an Annie Award for Best Short Film, but uh, uh, you know, Dan really wanted to get that Oscar. Yeah, well, it was a great film. Um, music. Now, finish this statement. Animation and music go together like... <laughs> oh boy uh peaches and cream i don't know there you go uh yeah I, I use a lot of music i have a, a sort of a stable of musicians that i use nicole reno and maureen mckellarin and and some other people that um i use a lot and um it's one of the most exciting parts of making a film is seeing the animation with the music Put together for the first time and it just makes the animation 10 times more powerful when you put well this is what i see even like starting with your feature the tune you use music to steer the visuals yes yes but, but you don't just do it for your shorts and and your features but you've also done music animated music videos yes a number of them, yeah. yeah. That's one of my big money makers now is doing music videos. I've done, I think, four or five this year. So yeah, I love doing that. Yeah, I saw your the the blues ones with uh, Jackie Green and that's yeah, one of my yeah, favorites. Green. Yeah, I yeah. love the blues. Right. So w watching those Jackie Green animated yeah. music yeah. videos are brilliant. Yeah, thank yeah. you, thank you. Yeah, yeah I, I, they commissioned five of those things, and that was really fun to do. I, is doing music with animation is just it's so delightful and then I, I use it for my my feature films too obviously yeah yeah now um in our opening we mentioned uh, how matt Groening calls you god yeah he was drunk and, when he said that <laughs> yeah oh, okay so um you're pretty close with matt both growing yeah. up in portland you know yeah and he's included you so much in the simpsons you've done seven Couch gags, opening yeah. couch gags, including yeah. the monumental 700th episode. Yes, opening. yes, thank you. Well, you did your research, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> what, what does Matt mean to you? Well, um, you know, he's an inspiration. Um, and the thing about him, have you ever met him? Did he ever come up here? Yeah, he's the nicest guy in the world. He's such a nice guy. He has every right to be rude and, 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 and demanding and short, but he's just a gentle, peace, peaceable guy. Uh, I remember he, we were in Annecy together once and, um, and he does a signing, him and David Silverman would, would do signings of The Simpsons. And as, as, as you'd expect, the line was like blocks long of people who want to get a signing of Matt and he would not give up. He would be there for four or five hours drawing Bart or Homer or whatever. And if there's someone in line, he will sign it. And I don't know if I would do that. <laughs> I would say, sorry, I gotta eat dinner or I gotta go watch a film or something. But he would he would sit there, him and David both would, would do that. The, um, yeah, I, the way I met Matt was, was kind of interesting. Um, uh, I was a student at Portland State University in uh, I think 68, something like that. And there was a Portland Film Festival, and I knew I wanted to get in a film, I wanted to do animation, so I, I stopped by the festival to see what they had, and they, they had this guy showing um, uh, documentaries, uh, they were industrials. Uh, do you know what industrial is? Yeah, of 
corporate film. And they were 20 minutes long and they were hilarious. They were so funny. And I, I went up to the guy and said, man, I love your industrials. You're, you're so funny. And he said, well, why don't you come up to my house and I'll show you some more of my films. You can see more. And I said, great. And so I went up there and there on the, in the living room on his hands and knees was Matt drawing cartoons because it was his dad, Homer Graney. And uh, Homer was a really nice guy, by the way, really neat guy. And uh, so I got to know them when, when Matt was, gosh, he had to be like 15 or something like that. And we've been friends ever since, even though he lives in LA uh, and I live in New York, you know, we'll occasionally run to each other at uh, film festivals or events like that. Yeah. But I, um, you know, his success has been so phenomenal and so amazing. He's got to be the richest artist in the world. I mean, he's got so much, so he's done so many films, so much merchandise. Um, and, and he's got just the most modest guy in the world. It's very simple. And, you know, when he goes to the Comic Cons, he walks around without a mask on. He doesn't wear any, you know, makeup or anything like that. He just walks around as Matt Groening and people come up and say, hey, Matt, how you doing? Can I have an autograph? And he, he gives it to him. Yeah. So I'm really impressed by him. He's really an amazing guy. Yeah. And nice to be a part of that legacy that, uh, that you are. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, he, again, it was an Annecy where uh, we were out in a boat, I think, and he, he, he looked at me and said, you know, Bill, you should do something for our show. And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And he said, well, we got these little couch gag things. You want to do some of those? And I said, sure. And so almost every year I've been doing a, a couch gag and they're, you know, they're seen by millions of people and the money's good. And, and uh, the producer, Al Jean, just says, do whatever you want. We love it. And that's it. <laughs> and so I can't believe I'm my luck uh, to, to do those things. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, we've all this past 16 months, we've all been going through COVID. How did, uh, how did COVID affect you and your work? Well, um, it, the good thing about it was my social life went down to zero as most everybody else did. And so I was, uh, uh, had all this free time to, to stay at home and draw. So I did, um, yeah, the last two years I've been doing so much stuff, shorts and, music videos and commercials and slide um, slides slides gonna be an epic it's 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 maybe about two hours a lot of animation in there and it's all ballpoint pin on on paper and it looks really cool I'm really excited about that so in a way I I kind of like the pandemic it, it it really helped my career I know that's pretty rude to say but it really helped my uh, my my production. Right, right. Well, and one of those productions that you did was that short that you've uh, submitted to the Spark Animation Festival is Demi's Panic. How yes. did you get involved in that project? Well, that was another guy who, was, who had seen my stuff. Uh, no, you know, it was. He, he met Maureen McKellarin, the musician, a friend of mine. And uh, Maureen suggested to him, well, you should show it to Bill Plimpton. He, he loves you know, doing projects like this. And so he sent it to me and, and I don't take all the projects that I get sent to me, but this one I thought was a really wonderful uh, story. It didn't have a lot of dialogue. It was, it was very visual and also it was something very meaningful. It was very dark um, and, um, you know, timely, incredibly timely. So I said, yeah, let's do it. And um, it took me about three or four months, I think, to finish it. And we're still working, polishing up the sound, but the sound is pretty much done. What we sent you was a rough soundtrack uh, mm -hmm. of, the, of the sound, but we're adding a few more effects here and there. Um, and um, I think this is the kind of film that could really go far because not only is it um, a really, uh, sort of unique animation. Some of the storytelling techniques that I use in animation are, are, are very cool, but also it's, 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 it's a political subject that everybody can relate to, that everybody can, knows about all over the world. So I think that's why it's-, it's, it's can, you, can you get into more detail of the theme? Yeah, it's about uh, COVID. 
COVID-19 mm -hmm. and how uh, it spreads around and you don't know it. So in this film, you get to see it spreading around <laughs> through the magic of animation. You get to see the, uh, the, the danger of these little red uh, balls, little, little balloon balls. And uh, it brings the fear factor up really high. So I think that's why it's, uh, it's something that's good. It could be really, really popular. Awesome. And your film slide, when do you expect to finish that now? Well, um, I've got about 20 pages of storyboard to finish animating. And that if I could just work on that, I could do it in a month, probably something like that. I can do about a page a day. <clears throat> but i got to make money to keep the studio going so i'm doing some other some other projects some music videos and some uh commercials and and uh some other projects um so i think i'll be done with the animation uh in the fall my, my hope is in the fall and then um we got to do the coloring excuse me the coloring we're looking for a studio to do the coloring right now and then the voices, obviously, and the sound and the, the music. The music we can do in probably three or four weeks. Uh, Marina's doing the music again. It's very, it's very um, Hank, uh, Hank uh, Williams, very Hank Williams music, uh, done by Hank Williams. But thank you, John. <laughs> I, I grew up with Hank Williams, and um, and it just seemed like this would be the perfect music to to do animation to it. It's so haunting and sad and and uh, cartoony. It's really cartoony music. My, my, yeah. my lover, she broke my heart. I crashed my car and now I'm going to jail. And you know, it's so- no, The Country Bears Jamboree. <laughs> no, it's the dark end of Country Bears Jamboree. Um, so that we can do really quickly. And um, I'm guessing 2022, which should have something to, to show. Well, we look forward to seeing that and hopefully you'll, yeah, well, yeah. And uh, well, our festival's in fall, so you could probably see yeah. in the fall, there you go. I would love to do something. You know, I don't know if you knew it or not, but I was a musician for a while. Um, I grew up loving country music. I played lap steel guitar and then I even bought a pedal steel and tried that. I wasn't very good, but it was just a such a beautiful instrument. And I was in a band with Marie McKellar in, uh, back in the 70s. We played bars and clubs around Manhattan, and it was a lot of fun. But I realized that I had to decide between either animation or music, because music is, if you want to be any good, you really got to play it, you know, four or five hours a day. And that's, that was my schedule for animation. So I, I made the choice to be an animator, but I still love to hear country Western, love to hear pedal steel. I love to hear, um, you know, those kind of songs. So uh, that's why I wanted to do slide. Yeah. And, and like we talked about before, music is still a, such a strong component of all your films. Yeah. And um uh, I think when you look at the history of animation, you're also looking at the history of music, modern music in animation. You look at back of the Fleischers with Cab yeah. Calloway and Louis Armstrong. Absolutely, yeah. I love that. Fantasia, and even you mentioned Yellow Submarine. And your yeah, oh, Yellow Submarine, one of my favorite all time films. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, this isn't a story, but I did want to give uh, kudos to uh, people who influenced me. And, um, it's a long list, and um, but there are people that really influenced the my style and my humor. Um, I already mentioned, um, you know, about Tex Avery and Bob Clamp and Windsor McKay and Disney and and Fleischers and all those people, but also uh, someone like um, N. C. Wyeth was a big influence. I, I look at his books all the time. And I see how we designed the the the, the, the painting uh, to really have a dynamic look and keep it keeps it really simple. Um, Edward Hopper, uh, a guy by the uh, name of Carlos Nine, N I N E, from Argentina. He just died recently, but he was one of my really big heroes. He was such a great illustrator. Uh, Peter De Sève was really good. Uh, Peter Chung, who did Aeon Flux, was really, really a big influence. 
And then the guy you had at um, at your festival, oh my, I always forget his name, Robert Valley. Yeah. Remember yeah. Robert Valley? Oh, yeah. Whoa. Whoa. Uh, the, the pear and apple cider is such a brilliant animation in that. That is just, just knocks me out. It's, it's so good. Um, Joanna Quinn, of course, uh, a big influence. Um, you know, there's so many. Uh, um, Marv Newland and Danny Ananucci. I mean, these guys really showed what adult animation could do. You know, what, th there's no limits to, to making great animation, you know, stuff like that. And of course, I'll have to say Pixar. Pixar is great storytelling, really great, uh, great films. Um, uh, Saul Steinberg, some of the illustrators, Jules Pfeiffer, um, you know, people like this, Milton Glaser, um, and I steal from all of them. <laughs> but that's okay because it looks original. When it comes out of my hand, it looks like it's it's not stolen, but uh, these people really influenced me a lot. Heinz Edelman, who did Yellow Submarine. I mean, I, I rip off his stuff all the time. He's really, really great. That's an interesting story, the whole Yellow Submarine story. Did you ever read the book? No. About Yellow Submarine? Apparently, um, when they decided to do it, King Features was, was commissioned to produce an animated feature film using the Beatles music. And so they uh, went to Milton Glaser to design the, design the film, be the art director for the film. And it would have been great to have Milton Glaser because he was so good. Uh, but he was really busy designing restaurants and, and uh, posters and things like that. So he suggested um, Heinz Edelman, who's a German illustrator uh, of, of really great, great fame. And also he could, Heinz Edelman could sort of mimic Milton Glaser's look and style. But what happened was apparently Peter Max was working as an intern for Pushpin Studios for Milton Glaser at that same moment. And uh, this is what I hear. I, I'm, I don't know this for, for truth, mm -hmm. but Peter Max in interviews will claim that he was the designer of Yellow Submarine. And you can see the similarities, but I think that Peter Max was influenced by both Heinz Edelman and Milton Glaser. And that's why it looks like uh, Yellow Submarine, but he, in fact, did not work on Yellow Submarine. It was, it was Heinz Edelman who gets, who should get all the credit for that, that brilliant film. That film really broke the the the, the stranglehold that Disney had on animated films. Yeah, it was so original, and so, um, so um, of the time, you know, the, the the Beatles, the hippies. It was such a a fresh breath of fresh air. For yeah, counterculture. Me. Yeah, counterculture. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. And that's why it's one of my favorite all-time films. It's, it's a film that, that um, I look at over and over again. And John, did you order up? I did. You I did. did. I ordered okay. it Friday. My, <laughs> my VHS is worn out, so I had to get a, a DVD of it. You still film. have VHS? Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I still have film. <laughs> yes. Good for you. Good for you. <laughs> um, I was going to say, uh, so a lot of students will be watching this. Good. What advice would you have if, for anybody going into animation? Well, I'm glad you told me that. Um, I have a lot of advice because I do talk at, at schools, you know, so I, I do, you know, Pixar and DreamWorks and those places, but also I do a lot of school visits and uh, I have what I call by three uh, three rules of uh, success in animation. I call it Plimpton's Dogma. And these are the three rules that I follow to be a success as an independent animator. Now, if you want to work for Disney or, or Pixar or something, don't follow these rules. These are not, not for you. These are for people who want to make their own films at home and hopefully uh, make money at it. Uh, rule number one is make your film short. And when I say short, I say about five minutes. All the dog films, guard dog, guide dog, horn dog, all, all of them are about five minutes long. And that's one reason they're, they're, they're so successful. Um, and plus it's, it's 
cheaper to make them for you know for five minutes if you make a 10 minute film or 15 minute film uh it's really expensive and i judge a lot of festivals as you know and if i see a 15 or 20 minute film on the list already i don't like that film i don't want to see it because i know if that's a bad film i got 15 minutes of wasted time <laughs> and, and yet and yet you liked pear cider and cigarettes running at 30 minutes <laughs> okay that's robert valley I'll, ex <laughs> I'll accept that and the man who planted trees you know there, there, are, you exceptions. there are exceptions um uh, number two is make your film cheap and thank god now with digital technology and um you know music is easy to to score you just, or just get free online you can make a film uh for I do it for about a thousand dollars a minute, so five thousand dollars to make a, a five minute film. That's about how much it cost me. So, and if you want to, want music, you know, you can probably go to the local bar or club and find a band that's really good that can do your music for free, or maybe even pay you to to play their music. So, um, and don't use any really famous people for voices or. Um, uh, voices that you find online that are famous people because you'll get billed for a lot of money for that. And number three, make the film funny. And um, I find that people really love to see funny films. Uh, if you want to make a political film or an abstract film or a, uh, a film to bear your soul to the world, go ahead, but no one's going to want to see it except maybe your folks. Uh, try and make a film that speaks to everybody and says it with a sense of humor. You can make a political film, but it's if it's funny, it's better. Or a personal film, if it's funny, you'll you'll sell it a lot easier than than uh, other films. One of my examples, the greatest example, and you probably know this, is Bambi meets Godzilla. Uh, it follows my Plimpton's dogma to a T, and I told Marv this, and and he laughed. Uh, it's it's what two minutes long at the most, maybe a minute and a half. I don't know. Yeah, uh, he made it for five hundred dollars. I heard he did it on the weekend, and uh, he spent five hundred dollars on the film, and it's incredibly funny. And he's made. According to him, this is what Marv said, uh, over $100,000 on that film, and he still, keep, still keeps making money. And um, it's probably the most successful animated film uh, ever. It's sort of the deep throat of animation. It's, he's made yeah. so much money on that film. And that's my goal, is to make a, a Bambi meets Godzilla and, and surpass Marv, but I'll never do it. I'll never, I'll never. Well, it's become even part of our lexicon that that expression yeah. bambi meets godzilla david david meets goliath even that's it yeah it's uh, something else actually i'm going to be with marv tomorrow we're going to be interviewing paul Dreesen. i heard i heard yeah, yeah. that's great too. i love paul too paul should be on my list of people who influenced me he uh, he was a big influence definitely mm -hmm. yeah just thinking uh, back to like your process like you're talking about writing and the key is writing, but you, so much of your animation looks spontaneous. Yes. So like, do you, you say you, you need to write that story you have, you're doing, let's say you're five minutes short on horn dog or guard dog, mm -hmm. but, but so much as you're animated along looks like all of a sudden this idea just comes to you as you're animating. So which yeah. comes first? Is it, is it the, Oh, no, it's definitely storyboarded. It's yeah. seriously storyboarded. Um, um, and I, I make changes, I make changes on the storyboard. And I, I sometimes I'll do an animatic. I'll put the music on and then show some of the stills and, and then I make changes. But I like it to look sort of improvisational, like it's off the top of my brain. I think that, that, that makes it interesting. I don't want to look really uh, too overplanned and, and over organized. I want it to look like an artist. I, I like the hand of the artist in there. I like mistakes in there. Um, I think mistakes make it look human, like it's a piece of art you'd see in an art museum. Yeah. And to me, that's that's appealing. Uh, you know, I love Pixar films, but I, all their circles are perfect circles, and all their straight lines are perfect straight lines. And I like to see the touch of the hand in there, and some wavy lines, and 
scribbly lines and stuff that's a little more impressionistic, not so uh, geometric. And that's and, what I'm no, they're do. doing photorealistic. They're doing photorealism. Exactly. And we're doing, and like you say, impressionism art. Impressionism, right, right, right. And I think there's a place for it. I think people will, will like that sort of style. And so that's why I continue doing it. Also, I would say to students that um, uh, look at a lot of films. They should come to your library and look at all your films. Uh, and, and the good film, look at the good films. You can see bad films too. You'll learn stuff from that. But look at the good films um, and, and be inspired by them. And if you see something that just really knocks you out, you can borrow it. You know, you can, you can uh, you know, put it in your film a little bit and eventually it'll evolve and, and become more your own work. Um, be curious. I think it's important to, to really be curious about why things do this. I always carry a, um, a notebook around. Oh, I left it on my, on my chair. Uh, and I draw ideas, I get ideas every day. I live in New York City, which is basically a cartoon city. So I always have a lot of uh, crazy ideas uh, walking through the streets and I write them down. And that was the inspiration for the original guard dog was I, I saw a dog barking at a little bird in a park right near where I, where I live. And I wondered why is that dog barking, afraid of a little bird, a cute little bird? Why is that dog afraid of that? And then I made up this whole scenario where the, the bird is planning <laughs> to kill his, his master and that, that became Guard Dog, which was a, a huge, a huge success. Yeah. So yeah, be curious and write down questions or write down ideas and little sketchy ideas. And, and that, that's really important. Yeah, excellent. Uh, any last thoughts? Yeah, you, you did it, you covered everything. Yeah, we covered Demi. One, one final story. Okay. Um, the Disney story. Okay, yeah, tell us the Disney story. Because, yeah, you applied, didn't you write when you were a boy? Tell us, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I wrote a Disney letter. I was 12 or 13, I think. I'd just gone to Disneyland and uh, with my aunt, because she lived down in Long Beach. And so I went to Disneyland, and my folks gave me 20 bucks to go on all the rides, you know, which obviously was impossible. And I passed the bookstore, and there on the book was um, the Disneyland book. And a Walt Disney book, I'm sorry, Walt Disney. And it's all about Walt Disney's life and his the studio and you know how they make films. And and I went, oh my God, I gotta have that book. And my aunt said, No, don't you want to go on the rides? You can get this book. And I said, No, I gotta have that book. And I spent all my money, all my 20 bucks on this book. And um, I still read the book today. It's really one of my my treasures. It it came out in uh what was it uh 60 no no 57 58 i think something like that it was right when um sleeping beauty was coming out they were promoting sleeping beauty and so i, I love that book and so it, it showed on here how to be an animator for walt disney and so i sent a letter to disney with some of my sketches of mickey mouse and donald duck and and uh they sent a nice letter back saying you know your work shows promise you're too young come back and 20 years. So I kind of forgot about it. And then uh, when I did Your Face and I got nominated for an Oscar, um, Disney contacted me. And this was the era, this was the magic time of the 80s when animation came back, came roaring back. You had um, Japanese animation with Akira and films like that. Uh, MTV was starting to show animation. Uh, Disney did uh, Little Mermaid, which was a big hit. Uh, Tron came out. Um, the um, uh, You're getting things like Nickelodeon and Cartoon yeah, Network. Nickelodeon and the Tournay of Animation and Spike and Mike were doing great stuff with animate. Roger Rabbit was a huge hit. Yeah. So they all everybody wanted animators in. And so they they'd seen my film Your Face and they sent me a, a letter saying we'd like to hire you. So they sent a lawyer to to New York. It comes in, nice suit and tie, big briefcase. He pulls out a giant contract, <laughs> puts it on my table, he looks at me in the eye and says, 
Walt Disney wants you to be our animator, work for us as an animator. I went, yay, they finally discovered my, my talents. And uh, I was working on the tune at this point. I was starting to do the tune. And I said, that's great. Can I work, still work on my crazy little shorts on the weekend? He said, yeah, you can do that, but Disney will own those films. What? I said, well, what happens if I tell someone a funny story, a funny joke? Oh yeah, that's Disney's. Uh, what if I have a dream? Oh, that Disney owns that. <laughs> I realized that I'm, I'm sort of become a, a slave to Disney. Now I don't begrudge Disney for that. So many people would do anything to work for Disney. They don't want to do these little short films on the side, but I still wanted to, I had a lot of ideas that I wanted to, to do and, and create. So I turned down Disney. I turned down a million bucks and working for Disney. And sometimes I wonder if that was such a smart idea. <laughs> if I maybe had, my life would have gone a different way. I'd be living in a penthouse in LA or a mansion in LA at this point. But um, every morning when I wake up and I go to my drawing board and draw whatever the hell I want, no one's looking over my shoulder saying, you got to change that. That's, that's going to offend somebody. You can't do that. Um, I say, you know what? I don't need a million bucks. This is, this is worth more to me than a million bucks. And that's why I'm an independent. That's right. Well, you may have turned down a career in a high paying, but soul crushing yeah. Hollywood yeah. animation <laughs> industry, but yeah. you are your own man, answerable to no one by yourself. Yeah. And yeah. you are your own independent animator. That's right. So, right. Bill Clinton, this has been a pleasure. I've good, been with this so Thank much. You. It's been a great hour. Thank you. Yes. Well, I hope to see you in the fall. Yeah. And uh, we look forward to seeing you in person. Not this year, yeah. but in years ahead. Years ahead. Okay. Very yeah. good. Thanks, Bill. Okay. See you later. And now, folks, it's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.